Right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for today's broadcast. I'm Lisa Nankin, the Academic D Director of the Siena Art Institute. And today we have a conversation together with faculty from the Siena Art Institute, as well as our partners at Brandeis University and our partners also at the Pinacoteca Nazionale di Siena, which is a beautiful museum of painting and sculptures in the historic center of Siena, Italy, where we're based. Uh, this is a chance to offer um, a glimpse into the experience of Brandeis in Siena, which allows students of Brandeis University, as well as other institutions, the chance to combine coursework in art history, as well as in studio art. It's a culturally immersive program that's led both by Brandeis faculty as well as Siena Art Institute faculty. And it's really a wonderful opportunity to experience in person the inspiration of the historic artwork of Siena. And then students are able to create their own artistic responses um, in their studio work. So joining us today, we have um, professors Unglob and Professor Walthall from Brandeis University, um, as well as the chance to hear from uh, Roberto Fineschi from the Siena Art Institute, Anthony, who is our representative from the Pinacoteca Museum in Siena. So to kick things off, we'll hear very briefly from Annalisa Giovanni at the uh, Pinacoteca Museum. And then after her, we'll hear from Roberto Fineschi, who is um, one of the teachers of the art history course from the Siena Art Institute. So first let's hear from Annalisa. Good evening, my name is Annalisa Giovanni and I work in this museum for the Ministry of Culture. I'm very glad to welcome you at the Pinacoteca Nazionale di Siena, the biggest national museum in Siena. It houses the largest gallery of Sienese paintings with a gold background uh, from 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. I'm in charge of the Eterno Presente project, thanks to which we have organized many cultural activities. We have created, together with the Siena Art Institute, a beautiful synergy between medieval art and contemporary creativity. Eterno Presente means eternal present. It's a reference by Cesare Brandi, famous for his restoration theory and the person who set up the Pinacoteca in 1932. Eterno presente, eternal present means uh, the artwork must be read in he, its process of aging changes and through the different readings. So we welcome the Siena Art Institute initiative and we hope to have uh, the Brandeis University with your students here as soon as possible. Thank you uh, you uh, and uh, Goodbye, <laughs> good evening, good work. So the Pinacoteca of Siena, one of the most amazing painting galleries in Italy that Brandeis and Siena students have the good fortune to visit during their program in Italy. So we have picked a theme uh, that is the, develop the development of space in the artworks uh, of the uh, Sienes painting from the 11th to the 15th, 16th century, uh, a period that is very much uh, representative of the um, Sienes Pinacoteca. So the, the gallery is famous for its collection of um, golden leaf altarpieces. So in front of you, there is a very beautiful example from the 13th century. The second one from the following century is these. Uh, and uh, if you also look at, at this third piece, we pick it, you can realize that um, uh, these artworks 
are religious artworks. So this could be misleading because um, like many contemporary people think, okay, so it's religion, I'm not interested in that, so I don't like those art, that art. So these, uh, we, we need to um, realize that uh, for centuries, artists could, uh, could not use any language but religious language, almost. Therefore, through this language, they actually uh, spoke out much more than just religious things, but also uh, talked about or asked the, the crucial questions of, uh, of human history that we still like ask ourselves, that is the meaning of life, the role of humans in history, but also expressed um, um, feelings, emotions, uh, uh, all things we are still very much inside, but again, just with a different with a different language. So, in this move from like uh, uh, more abstract uh, um, representation of space and figures to a more concrete and uh, and uh, humanized, we uh, appreciate an historical change, an historical passage where like people. Uh, coming out from the dark ages, moved back to the cities and started a new life together in communities with rules, with trials, with a very lively economy based on like uh, uh, merchant activities, bankers, um, a new set of mind, a new practical people that also aimed at making money, at making like a position in life, at like improving their social status all these much more practical guys started to think about uh, space, about humans, so it's about divinities in a much more concrete way. And so they, since art was a way to represent themselves, uh, even if still again through religious language, so the, the what they had in mind was a space that could be the concrete space they lived in that is measurable like three-dimensional with depth with precise dimensions also the figures were not anymore the flat abstract frontal uh, iconic byzantine style uh, um, saint peter in this case that you have in front of you but became a yes of course the queen of heaven but also a heartly mother as you can see here so this mix uh, moved gradually toward this more uh, explicit realism, um, three-dimensionality, speciality, to the point, as you can appreciate in this latest piece, you have architecture, and not just that, but also a landscape, a naturalistic landscape, like uh, a sky, blue sky, so atmosphere, so, uh, so dark clouds, so this concreteness is a sign of the time, a sign of a development where uh, new forms of life emerged, more democratic form of life, more like dynamic economic uh, uh, form of life that are basically the roots of our society. And so we can <laughs> find in those pieces a very concrete track of what we are nowadays. Okay, thank you for your attention and really looking forward to meeting you in person for the Brandeis in Siena program in Siena. Bye. Great. Right, so thank you so much uh, to Roberto Fineschi. And our next presenter will be Professor Jonathan Unglaub from Brandeis University. Um, as we have people from our audience joining us, people on YouTube as well as on Facebook, it's so nice to have you all joining us for this live broadcast today. I'll just mention um, if you have questions or comments, feel free to, to write those in the comment section, either on Facebook or YouTube. And in the latter part of the broadcast today, we'll be able to respond live to your questions and comments. So without further ado, here's Professor Unglau. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lisa, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I teach at the Brandeis and Siena program on alternate summers. Uh, I won't be teaching in 2022, but I can tell you from my previous experiences that teaching in front of original works of art 
uh, in places like the Pinacoteca Nazionale in Siena uh, is one of the most rewarding teaching experiences I uh, have had. Indeed, the Pinacoteca, as well as the churches and palaces of Siena, serve uh, as our course laboratory. Whenever possible, uh, we teach art history in front of the uh, objects uh, themselves. And today I just want to look very briefly at three masterpieces from the Pinacoteca, uh, which trace the development of representational space uh, in sacred uh, painting. Now, the first work we're looking at is a small altarpiece or a dossal, a painting that went above an altar uh, from around 1270 by Guido de Graziano. Uh, as is typical for religious artwork of this period, uh, uh, the negative space is represented in gold leaf. These are known as gold ground pictures, and the figurative elements are rendered in tempera. Uh, here we see at the center the enthroned saint who was venerated presumably at this particular altar, St. Peter, and he's surrounded by small-scale narrative scenes that resemble Byzantine uh, narrative icons known as uh, predelle. Uh, here we see St. Peter. He's presented very imperiously. He has this impassive attitude. He's offering his benediction with his right uh, hand, and he's an imposing figure, but he's essentially flat and decorative in conception. Uh, look at how the throne on which he sits kind of wraps around him rather than becoming a convincing cubic form in space. But I should say something about the gold ground. The gold ground is not necessarily a lack of space but a metaphorical space to represent a mystic spiritual realm. Uh, could I have the next slide? And let's just zoom in on one of the narrative uh, predelle that surround the central image. It shows the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary. Uh, the other narrative scenes relate to stories from the life of St. Peter, but since Siena was the city of the Virgin, the Virgin Mary was the patron saint, uh, whenever there was an opportunity to represent scenes from the uh, infancy of Christ, they were taken. And here we see the seminal moment, so to speak, when the archangel Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary that she will become pregnant with Jesus, uh, with the Son of God. This moment is known as the Annunciation, and what's taking place is the incarnation of God into human flesh within her wombs. Uh, in the predelle, we can see a little bit more freedom. Look at the diagonal intensity of the angel as he greets the Virgin Mary. Mary recoils in confusion. The dove that represents the Holy Spirit descends toward her. And this is God's word that will become manifest in her womb as Jesus. In the background, we see buildings that are medieval and Gothic in style, but they don't relate in any rational way with the figurative drama in the foreground. And they are simply anchored to a ground plane, but there's no real representation of space. Uh, can we go to the first clip, please? And the clips just you know, show you the possibility of immersing yourself into these paintings. You can see the cracking of the pigment, uh, the shape and texture of the moldings as opposed to the pictorial uh, surface. And uh, the Pinacoteque also showcases natural illumination. So you can see the colors as they were uh, intended. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? The next work we're going to look at is by uh, Ambrogio Lorenzetti, who was the leading master in uh, Florence, excuse me, in Siena, just before the Great Plague of 1348. And he represents the culmination of Sienese medieval painting, but he is also an important harbinger of the uh, Renaissance. Uh, could I have the next slide? 
if we compare his representation of the Annunciation with the Graziano, we can see that there is still a gold backdrop, but we have this receding pavement, which designates an interior and also creates a spatial enclosure around the figures, a kind of enclosure that's also designated in the way that the throne curves around the body of the Virgin Mary and underscores that she becomes an enclosure for the Spirit of God through her womb in which Jesus uh, is uh, generated. We also see the articulation of the drama uh, between the figures. Uh, the kneeling angel Gabriel has this kind of hitchhiking gesture, but it's intended to indicate that he's a messenger. He's relaying the greeting of the Lord to the Virgin Mary. Uh, he is referencing someone else. The Virgin Mary herself has just been reading her scripture, and she looks up to receive the descending uh, angel. Uh, can we have the... Uh, Eclipse, please. Now, when you look on the surface here, you can see that there are uh, there's texture in the gold ground. There's a halo embossed around the Virgin. There is text that passes between the angel uh, and the uh, Virgin Mary. Also, the space is divided uh, by a column. Can we have the next slide, please? And we see a kind of dialogue taking place between uh, the Virgin Mary and Gabriel. If you'll see the words that extend a diagonal towards the Virgin Mary says, here is the God, here is God's maid, Ecce Ancella Domini. Uh, the passage below that extends horizontally towards her neck is uttered from the mouth of Gabriel. Gabriel usually says, Ave Maria plena grazia, or Hail Mary full of grace. But here he says, Non est impossibile apud Deum one verbum. Nothing is impossible for God's word. And what we see here is God's word becoming flesh, the seemingly impossible within the womb of the Virgin Mary. And if you notice, the words and the dove of the Holy Spirit are oriented towards the Virgin Mary's ear because she conceives the word of God within her. The word is made flesh. And so the Holy Spirit is descending towards her ear, which is also a uh, privileged through the beautiful earring uh, that that she wears. Could I have the next slide, please? And then look at the space now. This is now a sacred enclosure. The painting uh, uh, exemplifies a kind of paradox. Nothing is impossible for the word of God. A paradox between a surface that the column delineates, as do the paired arches that divide the composition, and the representation of three-dimensional depth, virtual depth, that's articulated through the receding orthogonals, these diagonal lines that indicate uh, lines perpendicular to the picture plane that extend towards uh, a vanishing point. And this painting is a watershed in the development of perspective because it's one of the first times in the history of art that these receding diagonal lines converge towards a common uh, vanishing point. Can I have the, uh, the next slide, uh, please? Now, if we jump ahead 150 years, uh, we come to the work of Domenico Beccafumi, who was the leading Sienese painter of the uh, 16th century. Uh, a few years before painting this work, the stigmatization of St. Catherine of Siena, uh, Beccafumi had traveled uh, to Rome, where he encountered the works of Raphael and others. And now we can really get a sense of how a spatial articulation developed in most sophisticated ways. Look at how we now have clear levels of depth. There is a foreground in which we see the witnesses of the paired male saints. 
Then there is the mystical realm of the miracle now articulated through the convincing representation of architecture that encloses the figure of St. Catherine. And then there is this landscape unfolding beyond, unfolding to a distant horizon line, which suggests infinity and uh, the grandeur of God in a more naturalistic way than the more abstract uh, gold grounds that we saw in the works of Graziano and uh, Lorenzetti. Uh, can I have in here, we can see that even the mystical, uh, the apparition around the virgin and child is represented naturalistically through atmospheric clouds, through uh, figures foreshortened in perspective. What had, what had been abstract in the earlier work, the flat gold ground, is now conveyed through naturalism. Uh, can we have the, the next slide, please? And what we see here represented is a miracle of St. Catherine of Siena, who was a Sienese holy woman. If you come to Siena, you'll encounter her representation many times over, and also her head, which is preserved in the Basilica of San Domenico. Uh, she, her devotion to Christ was such that she was rewarded with his wounds from the crucifixion. We can see uh, on the right an earlier representation of this miracle by Giovanni di Paolo, a pictorial cycle on the la life of St. Catherine uh, that was produced contemporaneously uh, with her canonization in the 1460s. Uh, we can see how the more earlier medievalizing style was perpetuated in Siena uh, well into the 15th century. But with Becca Fumi, uh, we can see uh, absolutely consummate representation of pictorial space and uh, the uh, convincing and dramatic posing of the uh, saint as she contorts her body to receive the blessed marks of her devotion, uh, the wounds of uh, Christ. Uh, can we have the next slide? And her uh, devotion to Jesus was not only rewarded by receiving his wounds, but she also had a vision depicted on the predella, which are now placed underneath the principal altarpiece. She has a vision in which she is betrothed to uh, Jesus uh, himself with the Virgin Mary officiating, and she receives a, a blessed ring. Uh, can we return to the clip? But much more uh, compelling than the slides, of course, is studying this uh, painting in person. Now represented in oil rather than tempera painting, that allows for the uh, blending of colors, and the absolute uh, capturing of very similar detail, whether it's the body of Christ or this wonderful flipped page and the impressed thumb going in, or even the angular precision of the architecture. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, this uh, brief look at three major paintings from the Pinacoteca. And now I'd like to turn over to Professor Joseph Wardwell, a uh, professor of painting at Brandeis, who will be lucky him in Siena uh, this, uh, this summer. Uh, you seem to be muted, Joe. So if you could just activate the microphone. Oh, sorry, sorry. No worries, it happens. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, thank you so much, Jonathan. Thanks to CNR Art Institute and um, the Pinocoteca for organizing this. Um, definitely on this freezing, freezing cold day in Boston and the middle of a surge, thinking about Siena and coming back to um, the Pinocoteca in person in the summer of 2022 is um, a bright spot in my day. So this is, is a pleasure to be with you. Um, my first visits to the Pinocoteca were back in 92, uh, 1992, that is, when I studied abroad in Siena myself. And um, we visited many times in our art history class, just like you can see with Roberto here teaching our Brandeis and Siena students. Uh, but we also had a pass where we could visit on our own as much as we wanted. And I visited over and over 
uh, during the year I was there, uh, often by myself. And it was like a private museum, really. And um, it was kind of one of the main places where I fell in love with Sienese painting. And um, it really became um, a dear uh, part of, or became an essential part of like who I became as an artist. And even way back then when I had um, little art history knowledge under my belt at that time, um, I knew there was something really incredible about Sienese painting. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Lisa? Um, now, I'm fortunate enough to bring my students there through our program, and we not only hold our history classes there, um, but it's it's important for us to be able to draw at the museum uh, uninterrupted, like you can see here, which is part of the studio class that I teach. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is actually my sketch in my sketchbook, but in my opinion, drawing from the masterworks like this in the Pinacoteca is far more important than simply skill building for drawing a building. Drawing is a language and a visual way of processing experience and information mm -hmm. and being able to study through the art history class and then be able to process that information and experience will bring the student or anyone closer to a work of art. Also, I'd point out, it's also simply a, 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 another way to, to be more present in front of a work of art and to spend more time than normally one would when looking at a painting, just absorbing information. Next slide, please. For example, here you can see Carrie Shang, a 2017 uh, Brandeis student, Brandeis and Siena student, drawing from the Sodoma fresco in the Pinacoteca and then recreating the version of it in the studio in oil paint. Can you go to the next slide, please? And here's a painting done in Siena where Anya Shire Plum uh, from 2019 has taken various elements and influences from other paintings and incorporating them into this model study. In particular, notice the floor from the Ambrosio Lorenzetti painting that Jonathan was just talking about, Annunciation painting that Jonathan was talking about. Can you go to the next slide? There, thank you. Um, and this was just painted this last past semester by Anya. And it's lovely to see this experience and influence that is now resurfaced a year and a half later uh, for Anya's senior thesis um, proposal. And this is how, it's important to know that this is how artists use other works to create their own, their own work, building on what came before them and looking at it a new way and representing it alongside their ideas. Like the uh, director of the Pinacoteca mentioned with the idea of the eternal present, this continuum is what I would say is essential, not because it only creates context for the new work of art, but it also renews context for the original sourced work of art. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, which brings me to the influences that Sienese paintings had on my work over the years. Um, I had somewhat what you would call, what I would say is sort of a traditional art history linear narrative. Basically, to sum it up rather crudely um, in regards to the Renaissance, uh, perspective and space equaled good, and flat compositions of color and overlapping speed, space equaled unskilled and bad. Um, but with the 20th century avant-garde collapsing space and combining imagery and representing different realities simultaneously, such as you can see here with the George Brock painting on the left and the Dada's Hana Hot collage on the right, the notion that simply skilled illusionism was good and flat was unskilled, all but disintegrated. If you can go to the next slide, please. An artist then could return to the work of the Renaissance and not simply look to the refinement of illusionist, illusionistic space and idealized human form, but could draw influence solely from geometry, color, composition, and flatness, such as the murals by Saul Lewitt. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and like Lewitt, I draw inspiration in most of my work from the color, drawing, and over overlapping space of Sienese painting. This slide shows a, a small Ambrosio Lorenzetti at the Pinacoteca next to a painting in process of mine from 2018. And hopefully you can see um, a relationship between the color, especially in uh, the gold and the reds um, in the bottom left of the Brog Lorenzetti. Can you go to the next slide, please? I'd also like to mention that I'm also influenced by the layering and the incomplete conditions of these paintings and frescoes. The way in which time and repainting can create flatness, disrupt or slow down the reading of space, creating another narrative or way of reading the imagery uh, 
again, this is alongside a painting in process of mine, the same painting in process of mine juxtaposed with a crucifixion at the Pinacoteca. You can go to the next slide, please. And here's that finished painting, uh, and you can see it, the scale of it here on the right. Um, and though bright and poppy, hopefully you can see the influence of the color and the composition in both illusionistic space in the landscape painting combined with flatness in, of the text, much like the Lorenzetti uh, Annunciation that combines two layers and two types of depicting space. Can you go to the next slide, please? And lastly, I'd just like to mention that I'm not only influenced by Sinu's painting on a formal level, like I've discussed here, talking about color, flatness, and composition, but working on my most recent large-scale mural, I've also been continually inspired by Lorenzetti's good and bad government, though not at the Pinocoteca, it's at the Palazzo Publico, which I often flippantly call a uh, medieval social justice painting. And while visiting this amazing civic masterpiece over my years of visiting Siena, I often reflect on the role of the artist and the responsibilities and opportunities an artist can have for civic engagement. Can you go to the next slide, please? And this is the painting that I just, uh, mural that I just completed. And these last two sh slides show um, some of the panels. It's for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library in Nubian Square. It's my first public public commission and is a collaboration with myself and local poets in the area. You go to the last slide. The piece is 62 running feet across three panels. And I think it is my version, e version of a Sienese fresco cycle. And its inspiration is deeply indebted to good and bad government. And hopefully you can see the influence. Well, at least the good, good government part. Thanks so much, and thanks for attending. And back to you, Lisa. Great, thank you so much um, for the insight both into the work of um, the students as well as your, your own work. And um, we, we've gotten a lot of um, great comments as well from, from our viewers. Uh, for example, we have a comment from uh, Jeff Shapiro who's saying it's exciting, exciting to see how the students metabolize art from six or seven centuries ago and use it um, in their own work. So um, certainly uh, really um, wonderful to have our, our viewers joining us and getting a, the chance to have a glimpse in into um, the activities of the Brandeis and Siena program. Um, there was um, a question that came in from um, another viewer, uh, Maggie, who's asking actually more of an art historical question here. Um, if um, there are any other women portrayed in Renaissance art with the stigmata or was uh, St. Catherine of Siena the only one? Uh, well, stigmata is something that frequently happens to uh, to female mystics. So there are a number of saints who receive the stigmata, such as Saint Rita of Cascina and Saint Faustina. And there are also people who, both men and women who haven't been sainted that receive stigmata. But usually uh, Saint Catherine is the one who was, of female mystics, is the one who is most frequently represented receiving the stigmata. And her stigmatization, of course, is an emulation of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, who uh, received stigmata about 150 years uh, prior uh, to uh, St. Catherine. She was also a Dominican who was a rival order to the Franciscans founded by St. Francis of Assisi. So uh, the Dominicans wanted to have a saint who was so uh, blessed and honored. Great, great. Um, yeah, and another um, just comment that's coming from a viewer, um, Lily, saying these examples of how students are learning from Sienna's art is very inspiring. So um, yeah, and it's it's really wonderful to to be able to see some of these responses. I'm curious just to hear from both of you in terms of um, you know since the program of Brandeis and Sienna has been running since 2015, if there are aspects of the Sienna's art that you find students are often struck by in particular, both from an art historical perspective or uh, from the perspective of their painting work with you. Well, I think they're. They're often surprised about the the range of of gold grounds. That it's when you're looking at slides or a book, it just seems to be gold. But when you're there in the museum, and I think some of your excellent uh, camera work captured this, uh, there is off there are often embossed halos. There are words inscribed into the gold ground. 
Uh, so I think that's uh, often a uh, often a, a revelation uh, to students that what seems like inert backdrop actually has a kind of life of its own. I would say I just add in that, like, you know, what I mentioned there in the, the first part of the talk is like, you, you know, I think that the, you know, unfortunate thing and some of something that, that, that we've always kind of um, tried to uh, rectify with a program is that there's so there's so often a schism in um, in both art history and studio to create into these two diverse situations where um, students spend their entire time learning art history in a room, writing down notes, and they spend all their time in studio, making studio work and not really reflecting that much other than a studio professor presenting um, work somewhat out of context. And so the, I think that one of the things that I find um, has uh, changed in response that we've kind of added into um, over the years since 2015, that is really having that moment where in the museum where students are, are learning in the lecture and then literally in the afternoon coming back and drawing in that same museum from the same work of art. And I think it's, you know, I actually, you know, like I showed my own <laughs> drawing in there and I get a lot out of that as well. Um, it's just a different way of processing and seeing how, um, you know, it really makes um, learning and living with a work of art more individualized when you start to be able to be able to unpack that information in a way that um, is more personal by sitting and drawing that and reflecting on what was heard in the art history class. And I think that like one to be able to experience a work of art is incredible in, in, in real life and to learn about it in real life at the same time, but then at the same time to then reflect on it and create, create alongside it, I think creates such a deeper um, relationship to um, artwork that can last a lifetime as opposed to something that you, you know, either hear in, in an art history class or studio class and you can't remember two hours later, you know, unless you're tested on it, of course. Of course. <laughs> And uh, we have a, a nice comment that's come in also from um, Franca Marini, who is another one of our faculty members at the Siena Art Institute, who teaches our painting course in alternate years. So just uh, to say many thanks to um, to you all for this uh, interesting analysis and the comments on Siena's painting and on its influences on contemporary painting. So it's great to have you joining us for this live stream, Franca. Uh, there was another question that came in um, actually uh, from another uh, viewer, Jeff, who's asking um, when you see works for the Siennese School in either the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum or the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, do you feel a special sense of connection? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's nice. I mean, the Gardner kind of has them kind of hidden back in like the, the, the back right of that room. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, you, you know, like you kind of, you know, I kind of uh, do feel a, a special connection um, to them, but I want them a little more prominent, but that's just me. Um, but the but at the same time, I mean, I think that ha having like a place like Gardner, the Gardner Museum, and seeing how much she loved Italy and how much she that uh, played a, such a huge part of her life does, absolutely helps helps feel like the that there's such a strong connection between um, this community and that community. Well, don't forget, there's the Simone Martini on the opposite side of the Giotto in the Gothic room. So oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's yep. not just that. Polyptic, you're right. Sort of there, yeah. In that room, which, which isn't as dark as it used to be, I, I've come to discover. I think they've put some new lighting in that in the in the Renaissance room. But also, you go to the Museum of Fine Arts and you see the the there's a small Duccio crucifixion and uh, altarpiece that's has its own case. It's in the center of the room, and you can kind of understand why the Duccio is is so important from having having been in Siena and seen his his masterpieces, especially the uh, Maya Sta in the, in the cathedral. Yes, absolutely. It's it's wonderful to have some um, gems of Sienese art, art to appreciate um, in Actually, other locations. Actually, there's a panel of the Maya Sta in the Mount Holyoke Art Museum. My alma mater. <laughs> so, well, but certainly that the chance. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, but certainly the chance to um to be in a museum like the Pinacoteca in Siena, where you're just surrounded by uh, such a vast array of masterpieces all in one location, is really uh, you know a very unique opportunity. 
uh, although of course glimpses can be found um, in other collections around the world. Uh, there's another uh, question that has just come in from another viewer, uh, Rebecca, who's asking, can you speak to how the Renaissance advanced the depiction of naturalistic space and how it differed from the practice in ancient Rome? Well, I guess the, the main difference between uh, some of the perspectival virtuosity you see in ancient Roman frescoes from Pompeii and, and other places and uh, the Renaissance is that ancient Roman architectural uh, painting tended to be tended to be a fantasy and and, and decorative uh, and even though it was very complex it often served as as a backdrop or just pure decoration whereas in in the Renaissance there is this this effort, to create a pictorial stage uh, in which a drama unfolds in a uh, convincing uh, spatial envelope. Whether it's mathematically precise, as would be the case with a Florentine perspective in the 15th century and in paintings such as the Beccafumi, or even if it was more empirical like you see in Northern Renaissance, there is this emphasis in creating a stage, creating a world that extends beyond the transparent uh, division of the picture plane. Whereas I don't think there was as uh, consistent an effort for that kind of impact in, in ancient Rome. But excellent question. Yes. Well, thank you. And more of uh, just a, a more general question, perhaps on the studio side of things, um, in terms of students creating their own response from the inspiration of the art history. Um, more specifically, could you speak to what responses from students are you hoping for in the painting course? Uh, uh, I mean, well, mostly, you, you know, it's kind of like what I mentioned when I showed, showed Anya's example of the paintings where they sort of see, you know, I think that there's um, you, you know, seeing the larger picture of the painting, but then seeing that how artists can take um, little elements of it, you can learn from it, you can take um, aspects of, you know, what we sort of traditionally think of a skill, whether it's form or whether it's space, but then you can use them to your own advantage, to your own, to your own, um, devices and i think that that's that's a lot of way i teach most of my classes but particularly in in the um painting sienna class in in brandeis and sienna is where you, you know you kind of you kind of study you learn some things but then you kind of you know you figure out how to use that as to create your own language and i think that you create your own voice and i think sometimes the idea of creativity or or being original in your own work is oftentimes thought of as something, you know, you're just, you know, sort of making something out of up out of your head, which we actually, if you look through our history, you know, it's kind of built, 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 built on what came before it. But I think, it, you know, oftentimes it, you know, it shouldn't or could, in my personal opinion, it shouldn't be um, sort of with reverence, you know, it's kind of like you got to take what you need uh, and make your own expression. And, and, and I think that that's, um, you know, one of the, one of the most important things to see, you know, come out of an experience like that but also like you know on the most more personal side too too is like you can um you, you know it's it's a you know that's sort of the larger you know becoming an artist experience but many of our students don't you know are going to study something else or have other majors and and to create some kind of you know some kind of not just study of some other painting but to create something that is their own that is a reflection of this moment that they have and living in another culture, living in another place, learning through through making work is a great, um, something to hold on to for a very long time. I look at sometimes look at the, the sketches and drawings and um, small paintings on paper I made when I was in Italy in 92. And and back in the day, I was like, oh, these are terrible, these are horrible. But you know, it's, it's amazing to see even um, so many years later, how much they contain of that experience, whether the quality is, you know, of the utmost or not, you know, it really does embody experience. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's really um, the value of having the opportunity to um, travel in person to see work, because I think that experiences more than just seeing something on a screen, although, of course, we're grateful to have the chance to also communicate digitally. Um, but certainly uh, the, the in-person aspect of the program, I think, really is 
very profound, both for appreciating the materiality from an art historical perspective, but also for that multi-sensory experience that you have um, also on the studio side. Um, perhaps we can bring into the conversation uh, from the study abroad office of Brandeis University. We also have on the line with us today, um, Ari Masetsky, who uh, can, oh yes, here he is, <laughs> great. It's good to have you with us, Ari. And um, perhaps maybe if you could just speak a bit to the, um, the process in terms of students who might be interested to participate in the program either this summer or for um, upcoming summers. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I don't think that there's anything that I can say that will do a better job of inspiring folks to think about Brandeis and Siena as an option for their summer um, than what Professor Wardwell and, and Professor Unglove have already shared. Oh, um, oh geez. But if you are interested in thinking about spending six weeks over the summer with Brandeis and, and Siena Art Institute faculty um, in Siena, our office would be happy to talk to you to learn more about your interests, to learn more about why you want to study abroad, why Siena, um, why this, this program in particular. Um, the program is open, of course, to, to Brandeis students, but also to students from outside of Brandeis. Um, we have a really strong history of welcoming students from a wide range of colleges, universities, backgrounds, um, and would love to welcome you even if you are not an undergraduate at Brandeis. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me, um, to Professor Wardwell, to Professor Unglob, um, or to Lisa over at Siena. Any of us would be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, and if you're interested in applying for the program, um, I would love to set up a time to meet with you. Um, to hear more about your interests and, and to talk you through the application process. Um, the program lasts for about six weeks from the beginning of July to the middle of August, um, obviously on site in Siena, um, and the application is due March 17th. So still plenty of time to think about your options for the summer, keep this in mind, and, and if you think that this is going to be the right option for you this summer, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much, I. And um, yeah, and thank you again to our, our viewers for your questions and comments during the broadcast. It's great to have you joining us for this live discussion. And to Professor Wardwell and Professor Unglaub, it's really great to have your point of view, your perspective, um, just to be able to appreciate the artwork from, yeah, from different viewpoints. I think in this um, moment of being at a distance from one another, I think it makes us appreciate all the more the opportunity to be in person, but also I think the artworks that you have chosen to share with us today are really interesting examples that have that dynamic of space to, I think, since I think perhaps in this day and age, we're perhaps more aware than ever of the space that we occupy and the idea of distance being distanced and how do you depict distance? So either if it's through the use of atmospheric perspective or the otherworldly distance of the gold background. It's really interesting to see those examples. Well, as there um, aren't other questions that have come in from our viewers, I think we can probably wrap up our discussion for today, but thank you all so much for joining us. It's really been a pleasure. Well, thank you for having us, Lisa. Thank you. I'll see you all very soon. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.